At NASA, the science that we do literally spans the universe. Um, most of you are familiar with our planetary studies, but our science really goes far beyond that. And so what I'd like to do for you today is kind of try to bring all of the science we do across NASA into one picture, because it really is all connected. Even though you might say, what does human spaceflight have to do with people studying the sun? Ultimately, everything we do is trying to better understand some very basic questions that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, but to go over all the different kinds of science we do, we do study our own sun. Uh, we try to understand how did the sun form, how does it act, and coming from the surface of the sun, we have these massive explosions, either solar flares or coronal mass ejections, where you get these streams of energetic particles uh, that come towards the Earth. And you may say, okay, who cares? Uh, when those streams of energetic particles hit the Earth, they can disrupt our communication satellites. They could make your TV not work. They could make your cell phone not work, which would obviously be a tragedy of epic proportions. Uh, so it's important to study the sun. It's important to understand how it behaves. But even more, when those solar flares occur and all those particles are streaming towards the Earth, just think if we had astronauts on the way to Mars or on their way to an asteroid they'd be very vulnerable to all that radiation coming from the sun. So it's really important to study the sun if we want to go out and explore the rest of the solar system. A lot of you are familiar with the work we do in astrophysics, studying the origins of the universe, the origins of galaxies. And we use things like the Hubble Space Telescope to probe deeper and deeper into the universe, which tells us about things that happen deeper and deeper in time in the history of, of the universe. Uh, and there's all kinds of really fundamental questions that we have. For example, there are black holes at the centers of most galaxies. What's with that? Uh, and how do black holes behave? And I, I learned after I started at chief, as chief scientist, there are actually different sizes of black holes. There's big ones and little ones. And if some of them suck too much stuff in, they actually burp it back out. Who knew? Um, so we really need to study so much more about the universe than we've been able to do. And most of you know that right now, right up somewhere above us, is the International Space Station. Uh, we have astronauts on the Inter International Space Station who every day are performing all kinds of experiments in microgravity. And you might say, well, why does that matter? Well, it turns out things don't operate quite the same way uh, in low gravity the way they do here on Earth. Um, for example, uh, you don't realize that so much of the way our human bodies work is a function of the fact that we evolved in this 1G force of gravity, the way our cardiovascular system works, the way our bones are, the way our muscles work. Uh, astronauts who go up, their, their intracranial pressure goes up and it can put pressure on their optic nerve and cause vision problems. So there's all sorts of effects on the human body when we take people into space. Now, if we want to send humans to Mars or to an asteroid where they're going to be in space for long periods of time, we need to figure out how to make humans more resilient to being in space. Also, we've found out through our long studies on the shuttle, through the shuttle program, we found out different things. For example, some types of bacteria become more virulent in space. Other types of bacteria become less virulent. It turns out in bacteria you have, or in plants, um, in, in rodents that we take up, you have genes. Again, that without this force of one gravity, genes are kind of turning on and off in ways that we don't understand. So when it becomes to this, comes to this issue of, of virulence in bacteria, we're trying to figure out if we can use that information to actually develop new vaccines. Most of you are probably familiar with the part of NASA we do with exploring our own solar system. We have spacecraft right now that literally span our entire solar system. We have a spacecraft called Messenger at Mercury. We have a spacecraft, uh, we have instruments on a spacecraft at Venus. We have a whole flotilla of spacecraft at Mars. Uh, we have a spacecraft on its way to Jupiter, the Juno spacecraft. Um, certainly at Saturn, and we have a probe called uh, New Horizons on its way to Pluto, which of course really isn't a planet. But, uh, and a lot of people aren't familiar with the fact that we have 17 spacecraft right now that are focused on planet Earth. How can we look homeward? How can we use all these NASA technologies to better understand our changing climate? With the rate of climate change so rapid, making these measurements, having understanding in detail uh, things like coastal processes, sea level rise, how are raising sea levels increasingly strong storms, how is that going to affect our very fragile coastal regions? And NASA uh, is working on that. Now I talked about what were some of the questions that actually link what we do together. 
And in most basic NASA documents put together by, you know, panels of important people, we actually come up with the most simple of questions that govern what it is we do at NASA. And these are the three questions. They show up, in, again, in most of our documents. Are we alone? How did we get here? And how does our universe work? So whether it's astrophysics or earth science or studying the sun, these three questions really connect everything that it is that we do. Now, when it comes to the universe, again, we look back in time, trying to understand the origins of how our universe formed, but also where is it going? How do things change over time? And some of my favorite images that have come back from the Hubble Space Telescope are these ones of colliding galaxies. It's an amazingly energetic process. When galaxies collide, you get new star formation. You get streams of gas that come, come off from the interaction of these galaxies. And, and if you think, well, this is kind of an interesting but esoteric kind of pretty image, this is actually the fate of our own galaxy, I hate to tell you that about eight billion years or so from now, we will collide with the Andromeda galaxy. So fasten your seatbelt. This is our own solar system. And back when I was in school, um, my children would say, my son would testify this back in the dark ages when I was in school, we had nine planets. You guys only have eight. And we had all kinds of theories about how our universe, or how our solar system formed. We have these rocky planets like Earth very close to the sun, we have gas giants further out, and we had models that said, okay, that's how when you have a sun forming and you have pressure and temperature decreasing away from the sun, this is how you get a solar system to form. But we only had one solar system to study. Just think if you were a doctor with only one patient. You might understand that patient fairly well, but how, long, how well would you really understand the progress of disease, the origins of disease? So we need more than one solar system, more than one planet, if we're really going to understand how planets or solar systems work. Well, luckily for us, technology over the last 20 years has amazingly imp improved. Tom and I were writing a book, and Tom was writing the chapter on extrasolar planets, planets around other stars. And the number of planets that were being detected was changing so fast, we had to keep revising the chapter. Well, then along came something called the Kepler Space Telescope. And over the past several years, Kepler, which is all these dots in yellow, Kepler has detected over 3,500 planet candidates. So we've gone from nine planets to eight to thousands of planets. So just think about our theories of how solar systems form, of how planets form. Everything is being turned on its head. Every textbook is being rewritten. And that's so exciting because what we don't know is all of a sudden seems like almost everything. It was like we had the foot of the elephant, but we had no idea what the leg of the elephant really looked like. And what's more exciting is Kepler's been able to give us all these planets, detect all these planets in sizes quite close to the size of the Earth. And they've not only found single planet systems, we now have multiple planet systems. It's found five planet solar systems, three planet solar systems. And we found that giant planets can form very close to stars, they can form far out, Rocky planets can form much further out from stars. So we've really had to go back to this fundamental model of how solar systems form and totally rethink it. And again, that's the exciting part of science, is when you get huge amounts of new data, you get to go back and really test your theories and say, well, where was I right? But where can I now use this information to really make great strides in what we know? But just wait. In three years, we're going to launch something called the James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb will not only be able to detect planets around other stars, it'll be able to measure their atmospheres. So it will tell us, can we find a planet with a nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere? Can we find a planet where the atmosphere is changing a lot that might indicate there's life on that planet? So, so when James Webb launches in 2018 and we start getting that data back, it's going to start really characterizing these thousands of planets, and that's going to be immensely exciting. Now back to our own planet, my favorite platter planet right now is actually Saturn, because I work on the Cassini radar team, and Cassini's been in orbit around Saturn for, for quite some time now, since 2003. Um, and Saturn is this amazing planet that has this whole menagerie of icy moons that have incredible processes from, it has a, a moon called Titan where it rains methane and it has seas or, that are basically made of gasoline. Uh, it has a moon called Enceladus that has an ocean under its icy crust and there's geysers that erupt from Enceladus. In fact, this blue ring that you see, the pale blue ring that's this outermost ring of, of Saturn, 
If you, you probably can't see in this light, but on the left side, there's a little white dot in the middle of the blue ring, and that's actually the moon Enceladus. But the amazing thing about this image is it was actually taken last summer when the Cassini team knew that the planets would be lined up just so. And so it actually turns out that the Earth is in this image um, right in between Saturn's rings on the right-hand side of the image. Um, and also Mercury's in the image, Venus is in the image. So it's this amazing look back at our own planet from millions of miles away at Saturn. Now the reason that we study planets is the whole, again, it's the same reason that we study solar systems. We're trying to look back and look at the processes that affect planetary surfaces, like, like volcanism. How does volcanism operate on Venus and Mars, and how can we learn more about volcanoes from studying these processes on other planets? But you notice from the picture of the Earth on the far right that our planet is a water planet, and that's something that we don't see anywhere else in the solar system. But we know that on Mars, back in its history, at some point, there was liquid water on the surface of Mars. There are riverbeds, dried up riverbeds, signs of ancient lakes, signs of, of, again, that there was standing water for a long time. Now, why is water important? Because we think water is a key ingredient in the evolution of life. So if Mars had water, it probably had organics, could Mars have actually had life? We have a whole campaign of studying Mars. Uh, we've landed successfully. The U.S. is the only country that's ever landed successfully on the surface of Mars, and we've done it seven times. These are some of the different landing sites, the different places that we've visited on Mars. And you might think, oh, looks like kind of a rocky place, a place for a geologist. But as we've been going through all these landed missions, we've been finding environments that indeed seem to tell us that maybe the conditions existed for Mar on Mars, maybe for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, where life could have actually evolved. We're trying hard to answer that question with our rovers, but we have a whole plan to explore Mars in more detail. And one of the ways we're planning right now is to explore Mars with humans. Because as a field geologist, and you see me out there working in Hawaii, uh, on a lava flow. As a field geologist, I have this bias that it's going to take scientists, it's going to take geologists and geochemists and astrobiologists down on the surface of Mars, actually picking up rocks, doing geology on the surface to actually really prove that life did evolve on Mars. Now, we're going to Mars probably in the 2030s, so that makes you guys excellent candidates to either help us get there through, we need a lot of technology development, we need studies on human health, uh, and we need a lot of work done. So this is a challenge to all of you. NASA also, as I said, is making all kinds of observations of our changing climate. From on the far left, you see ocean salinity. We study flooding like happened here in Missouri a couple years ago. We monitor very carefully the melting of the Arctic ice cap. Uh, global warming is the most intense right now. The temperatures have risen the most near in the Arctic, and so we have a lot of attention being paid in that, in that region. Because with the Arctic ice cap gone, the Arctic Sea is, is, is um, getting a lot of uh, heat. It's heating up, which is putting a lot of energy into the climate system. Uh, and obviously, we want to understand the effects of that. Um, on the end there, you see a hurricane. So how is that affecting our weather? We're really not sure. So we have a lot of work left to do, a lot of measurements to make, um, to really, again, try to understand our chi changing climate. I mentioned the International Space Station. And we're really excited because just this year, we got the space station extended till 2024. Uh, and that gives us time now to really use the space station uh, as a platform for experimentation. And we're inviting, in fact, we had a local high school sent up this fall a CubeSat, uh, a little tiny satellite. So it's a challenge to all of you also to look into the ISS and try to see how you can better use, utilize it in the future. And NASA, though, it's really the people uh, who are making the discoveries, who are doing things like developing the mirrors for the James Webb Space Telescope, we have scientists out in the field in Antarctica studying, uh, studying the ice cap and picking up meteorites. We have astronauts up on the International Space Station. And we have all of our engineers and technologists who helped us to land the Curiosity rover successfully on Mars. So it's really the people of NASA who innovate, who explore, who discover, who inspire. And I invite all of you to join us. Thank you.